Hello. In this recording, I want to cover the basics of the law relating to baselines and maritime delimitation. Now, the reason baselines are important is that all zones are measured from baselines, and delimitation deals with the situation where two states with uh, opposite or adjacent coastlines have potentially overlapping entitlements and need to draw a common maritime boundary. So we'll start with uh, why this is relevant in a sense to our previous study of maritime zones. So if we look at uh, the zones stemming out from the land, everything is measured from baselines, the territorial sea, the contiguous zone, the exclusive economic zone. And beyond the EEZ, we have the high seas. And just to remind ourselves, there's also going to be the question of the continental shelf, which, uh, as we explore in other classes, can extend beyond the 200 nautical mile exclusive economic zone. But if there isn't a physical continental shelf extending as far as 200 nautical miles, a state still has rights in seabed resources up to 200 nautical miles as part of the exclusive economic zone regime. So there'll often be a question in delimitations about what happens beyond 200 nautical miles where uh, there may be continental shelf claims or due to the configuration of the coast, one state's potential 200 nautical mile EEZ overlaps what might be another state's continental shelf where their EEZ doesn't extend as far. And we'll see some practical examples. There's also a question we'll explore in other sessions about the limits, the outer limits of that continental shelf beyond 200 nautical miles, because where the continental shelf ends, the deep seabed area administered by the International Seabed Authority starts. But let's go back to the beginning and the question of baselines. What are the rules on baselines? So these are outlined in a number of provisions of UNCLOS, and we're going to focus on a handful. So the first point is that under Article 3, every state has the right to establish the breadth of its territorial sea up to a limit not exceeding 12 nautical miles measured from baselines. So Article 5 under UNCLOS, the normal baseline for measuring the breadth of the territorial sea is the low water line along the coast. So that's our basic rule, the low water mark. But um, that still leaves some questions unresolved as to what low water mark you're using and how many points along the coast you select because there might be different low tides at different points in the year and you might get a different projection of your coast depending on which base points you select. Uh, we then have the uh, finally Article 6. In the case of islands situated on atolls or of islands having fringing reefs, the baseline for measuring the breadth of the territorial sea is the seaward low water line of the reef. So you can measure from the outer edge of reefs in some cases. Now, Article 7 uh, deals with deeply indented coastlines or fringes of islands, which in these circumstances you may use straight baselines, effectively joining lines. But the critical thing here is paragraph 3. The drawing of straight baselines must not depart to any appreciable extent from the general direction of the coast, and sea areas lying within the lines must be sufficiently closely linked to the land domain to be subject to the regime of internal waters, so to be treated as if they were ports or harbours. So we'll come to some examples of this, but the things to bear in mind here are the idea of deeply indented coast, fringing reefs, and straight baselines that cannot appreciably depart from the general direction of the coast and the waters enclosed have to in some sense be broadly in a comparable position to ports and harbours. Okay, so here is an example of fringing islands. So because there are a collection of islands immediately adjacent the coast, it makes, as it were, sense to enclose them with straight baselines. The straight baselines can't go out to the more distant islands, only those close to the coast. And these are, um, this is sort of a test of reasonableness. What will the international community tolerate as an acceptable use of the fringing islands rule? There aren't hard, fast mathematical rules. Similarly, the idea of a deeply indented coastline. Um, you may have uh, situations, particularly say the fjords of Scandinavia, where it would simply be impractical to try and trace baselines around every indentation. Okay, um, 
so those are general rules about baselines. Uh, we then come to some slightly more complicated provisions to do with the idea of a bay. So let's look at Article 10. This article relates to the bays, the coasts of which belong to a single state. So the general rule in paragraph 2 is the semicircle rule, which is that you can treat it in you can treat a bay as internal waters that can be closed by a single joining line so long as the bay is larger as large or larger than a semicircle whose diameter is a line drawn across the mouth of the indentation. So for example, Sydney Harbour, the heads to Sydney Harbour are very narrow compared to the vast expanse of the harbour itself. And so Sydney Harbour would obviously bigger, be bigger than a half circle drawn across the mouth of the heads. And we'll see some other examples as well. Now, uh, where that entrance to the harbour is broken up, as it were, by a number of islands, you can draw a semicircle based on a number, the length of the joining lines um, across these different mouths. We'll see an example of that in a second. Now, uh, you can use a single line so long as that closing line does not exceed 24 nautical miles, or indeed uh, a joined up kind of line in paragraph three. So there's a 24 nautical mile limit. Where the mouth of the bay uh, is wider than 24 nautical miles, you get to draw a single 24 nautical mile line within the bay that encloses the maximum possible area. What does all of this mean in practice? Let's look at sort of Tanaka's examples. So we have here uh, on the far left an example of the semicircle rule. We have a bay that is much bigger than a 24 nautical mile half circle drawn across the uh, opening points of the mouth to the bay. But then uh, the second image from the left, we have a much shallower bay that does not equal or exceed the semicircle rule, so that cannot be a bay and you cannot draw a closing line across it. You have to measure the baselines along the curvature of the coast. The third image shows um, a very large bay indeed with a wider mouth than 24 nautical miles. So under paragraph 5 you only get to draw the closing line a fair way into the bay. And finally the image on the right shows the effect of having, say, an island in the mouth of the bay, uh, drawing lines, uh, closing lines across the mouth because you still have a semicircle that is wider than the diameter uh, created by joining lines across the mouth of the bay. So those are um, examples of legal bays under Article 10. Moving on, um, there is the question of historic bays. So historic bays are a type of historic water. These are waters which are treated as internal, not the territorial sea, but subject to the full sovereignty of the coastal state for historical reasons. Um, to have historical bays or historical waters, you have to be able to demonstrate long and uncontested assertions of sovereignty. And some of the relevant cases are listed there on the slide. So there's no one rule or legal system of historic waters. It's more a question of proving a special rule by evidence, which becomes relevant to some extent when we look at the South China Sea dispute in later classes. Uh, now, there's also the question of what can you do with bays bordered by multiple states? So there's a conflict of views here. The minority view is that states can divide such a bay by agreement. They can use the general rule on bays and then carve it up. Um, but the majority uh, view is that, you know, unless you can fall within Article 10 or the historic waters regime, then you can't draw a closing line across a bay joint uh, that is bordered by multiple states. Now, um, there is a, an exception to this. Uh, the Gulf of Finesca was long treated as sovereign waters held by El Salvador, Honduras and Nicaragua so it could be enclosed and divided, and that was in the land, island and maritime frontier dispute case. 
but that's effectively an example of historic waters because it had always been treated in this manner prior to one cloth, it could be preserved. All right, there's also the question of a low tide, uh, a so-called low tide elevation. So these are sometimes called drying rocks. The concept is that uh, these are features that are above water at low tide but completely submerged at high tide. So these may use, be used um, as base points to effectively push the territorial sea further out, but only where the low tide elevations are found within a 12 nautical mile territorial sea drawn without reference to them. Uh, what do we mean by this? Um, Tanaka's diagram here is useful. If you see, you have a 12 nautical mile uh, rule being um, illustrated over here. And of the three low tide elevations, only one is found within that ordinary 12 nautical mile limit. So you can use it as a base point to fur project further forward the territorial sea at that point. Simply put, low tide elevations within 12 nautical miles of the coast can adjust uh, the limits of the territorial sea. Otherwise, low tide elevations generate no zones of their own. Um, we then come to the question of islands, which we'll return to in more detail in a different recording. But the essential point here to note is that an island is a naturally formed area of land surrounded by water and it's above water at high tide. So that's the core definition. The benefit of having sovereignty over an island is that in paragraph two, you get a complete suite of zones as if it were mainland territory, including the exclusive economic zone and the continental shelf. So these are potentially enormously valuable for generating jurisdiction over resources. However, the exception is article three. Rocks which cannot sustain human habitation or economic life of their own shall have no EEZ or continental shelf. They may generate only a territorial sea and a contiguous zone. So it's very valuable to have an island because you get an exclusive economic zone, but it is much less valuable to have a mere rock. So that distinction between rocks and islands becomes also important in maritime boundary disputes because a rock might only shift a maritime boundary by say 12 nautical miles, an island could generate 200 mile zones and potentially large overlapping entitlements. All right, um, there's also a brief question about archipelagic states. So archipelagos are obviously collections of islands and some states um, such as Indonesia are made, or the Philippines are made up entirely of such islands. So the question becomes, can you enclose these islands within a system of straight baselines, uh, thus subjecting um, the waters enclosed to a regime of archipelagic waters, which is in some ways similar to a territorial sea. The key point here is that you get to use large baselines to enclose your system of islands under uh, paragraph two of article 47 up to 100 nautical miles. So that's potentially a big advantage. But um, to be an archipelagic state capable of using this straight baseline system, one, you have to be entirely, a state entirely composed of islands, and two, you have to be able to draw a system of baselines such that you enclose waters where the ratio between uh, water to land area is either one to one or nine to one. So for example, it would be very hard to come up with a system of straight baselines around Japan that resulted in that ratio, but rather easier in the case of the Philippines or Indonesia. So that ratio question of one to one, between one to one and nine to one is important in whether you get to draw baselines around an archipelago. All right, so let's put some of these things in context. Um, and look at some cases where uh, the view has been taken that certain claims about straight baselines are excessive. So if we look at Albania's system of straight baselines, we can see that most of these baselines are drawn 
uh, in a way that would probably not satisfy the semicircle rule. Uh, maybe you'd get close to it at this top indentation, but you certainly wouldn't lower down. And it would also be very hard to argue that these are deeply indented coastlines. Then we have a long straight joining line um, to an island. So this use of straight baselines does not appear to correspond um, to the rules in the Law of the Sea Convention. Um, similarly, we have, in the case of Ecuador, a very interesting uh, collection of straight baselines. Again, um, you wouldn't say any of these necessarily pass the rules on bays, and there's no real attempt to do anything plausible connecting uh, this line between Point Galera and uh, a point off La Plata Island with uh, another point, Santa Elena. Um, these points appear to have been chosen uh, simply to enclose the maximum possible area, and it would be hard to say that the area inside this line should be treated as equivalent to ports or internal waters. We then have on the left the interesting proposition that the Gulf of uh, Guayaquil can simply be divided up between Peru and Ecuador. And again, that would generally not be permitted or viewed as permissible under UNCLOS. Um, finally, we have uh, probably the most excessive straight baseline claim known that around uh, Vietnam, where a series of purely uh, geographical points have been selected uh, that enclose an enormous area as allegedly internal waters and project a territorial sea uh, from them. So this leads to uh, international disputes about um, freedom of navigation between coastal states and other states, and can lead to significant questions, for example, about whether say, um, a warship is engaged in freedom of navigation or innocent passage uh, because, for example, 12 nautical miles from a point on the coast down in the uh, southeast of Vietnam, uh, drawing it straight from the coast would quite possibly you know, not reach past their official, uh, what they regard as their baselines, whereas drawing 12 nautical miles from the baselines would enclose a significant area of uh, the high seas. All right, um, now another um, question uh, arises, for example, in the case of the UK's use of straight baselines around the Falkland Islands. Um, one, it's not obvious that this baseline system passes the one-to-one -one ratio, but more than that, the UK can't re realistically claim to be an archipelago. Uh, irrespective of the dispute over the Falkland Islands between Argentina and the UK, the Falkland Islands lie on the other side of the world. It's not possible to draw a system of baselines all the way from the UK that go out and encompass the Falklands. So again, this use of straight baselines would generally be viewed as controversial. All right, but presuming we know where zones start from, the next question is how we draw boundaries between states. So we're going to go over the general rules about delimitation and then um, look at uh, some real cases and how they resolve particular problems that tend to arise in delimitation cases. So Tanaka defines delimitation as the process of establishing lines separating the spatial ambit of coastal state jurisdiction over maritime space where the potential claim to legal title overlaps with that of another state. So the essential idea here is you have overlapping legal claims and the need to draw a line between them. And Tanaka talks about the uh, triple rule. You can always settle a boundary by agreement. The next step is always to start with an equidistance line, a line of equal distance between the two affected coastlines. And then that, might, that equidistance line might be modified by any special or relevant circumstances. And uh, we'll look at that in more detail. But first, we have the Convention on the Territorial Sea and the Contiguous Zone, one of the Geneva Conventions of 1958, which talks about uh, where the coasts of two states are opposite or adjacent to each other. Neither of the states is entitled, failing agreement, to extend its territorial sea beyond the median line 
so we could also now call this an equidistance line, uh, every point of which is equidistant from the nearest points on the baselines from which the breadth of the territorial seas of each state is measured. Now opposite and adjacent coasts is technical language, but basically it boils down to do the two states face each other or do the two states sit on the same coastline? So states can be opposite each other for the purposes of delimitation or adjacent sitting on the one coastline. Now we then have uh, a qualification to Article 12. Article 12.1 continues on, the provisions of this paragraph shall not apply, however, where it is necessary by reason of historic title or other special circumstance to delimit the territorial seas in some other manner. So here we have the beginnings of an equidistance and special circumstance test. Uh, however, the provision on the contiguous zone only talks in terms of equidistance. Now, how has the law evolved since the 58 Convention? Well, the Convention on the Continental Shelf uh, talks about uh, in the absence of agreement and unless another boundary is justified by special circumstances, you draw a median line based on equidistance. Um, and uh, again, um, absent special circumstances in the case of uh, adjacent states, you would draw um, a delimitation line based on equidistance. So Article 6 uh, again has this language of opposite and adjacent coasts and again an equidistance line with a special circumstances rule. So we'll come back to what constitutes special or relevant circumstances. So we get to uh, the Convention on the Law of the Sea and um, again the language here is very familiar. Uh, as regards the territorial sea we deal with a median line in the first instance but taking language directly from the Geneva Convention we might vary that line where there is a question of historic title or special circumstances. So far so good. Then, however, we get to the question of what do we do with the new zones, the continental shelf and the exclusive economic zone. And uh, we have this language, the delimitation of the exclusive economic zone or continental shelf between states with opposite or adjacent coasts shall be affected by agreement on the basis of international law as referred to in Article 38 of the Statute of the International Court of Justice in order to achieve an equitable solution. Um, this drafting is plainly a mess. Article 38 of the ICJ statute refers to treaty, custom, general principles of law recognised by all nations and the writings of eminent publicists. It is a shopping list of the sources of international law, not anything you can apply. And then on top of that, we have the idea that the goal is an equitable solution. So notions of equity have been imported as well. So this is your classic unclos compromise drafting. The states were uh, reluctant uh, in some cases to accede to the existence of these new zones and hesitant about how they might be delimited. So this is plainly placeholder language. Um, but we can say that it probably incorporates customary international law or ICJ practice into the Law of the Sea Convention. Um, Tanaka notes that that formulation in UNCLOS is meaningless of itself. As I've said, there's ambiguity about the equitable solution. As I've said, the reference to Article 38 is unhelpful. Uh, and then there's also a, a certain complexity introduced regarding the idea that um, uh, Article 311 of UNCLOS says that UNCLOS prevails over the Geneva Conventions, um, which then raises the question, well, can you or can you not turn to the rules found in, say, the Convention uh, on the Continental Shelf? which would have given you um, a rule based on median line and special circumstances? Or is that reference precluded when the two states are already parties to UNCLOS because you have these other provisions dealing with delimitation? In the end, courts have not tied themselves in knots over the impact of Article 311, despite Tanaka's interesting analysis. Uh, so what is the customary law? Well, Tanaka uh, distinguishes between results-oriented equity and corrective equity in the jurisprudence, which is to say that the earlier 20th century cases on maritime delimitation, including the classic North Sea Continental Shelf cases, emphasise equity. 
The job of the court is to come to an equitable solution and there is no compulsory method or formula to follow. Um, that uh, approach is still present in uh, 1982 in the Tunisia-Libya case where again the ICJ, the International Court of Justice, says there's no fixed method but says that you might choose among methods based on the relevant circumstances of the case because the geography of every coastline varies. Um, so this results-oriented equity approach generally prevails into the early 1990s. The idea that the job of the court is to come to an equitable solution and the method it adopts might vary from case to case. This is obviously not very satisfactory from the point of view of having reasonably clear and predictable rules. Um, however, uh, in uh, the Libya Malta case, we have a move towards what Tanaka would call corrective equity. You don't start from a presumption that you're going to get to an equitable solution. You start from a presumption that you should always start by drawing an equidistance line. Then you look at whether that equidistance line should be modified in light of other circumstances. So the turning point uh, is really the Greenland Jan Mayen case of 1993, which quotes to some of the earlier uh, jurisprudence amongst some fairly inconsistent case law up to this point. Now it finds that there is uh, no difference at all in terms of method between the customary international law rule and Article 6 of um, the Territorial Sea Convention of 1958. So you begin with a median line and consider special circumstances. Um, now it notes that the case law had generally talked um, about relevant circumstances while the treaties talked about special circumstances but it effectively says this will come to the same thing. Um, now there may be certain cases where you can't start with a median line and we'll see an example of that in Nicaragua, Honduras, a case concerning um, case, uh, adjacent states on, a, uh, on the same continental coastline. All right, but essentially by the 1990s, we're seeing this shift towards start with a median or equidistance line. So what method is now adopted in practice? Well, essentially the ICJ has settled on an equidistance relevant circumstances method. Uh, and since the Black Sea case of 2009, and we'll come to some maps from the Black Sea case, this has involved three steps. First, you always draw a provisional equidistance line between the two coastlines. Second, you adjust that line for relevant circumstances. And third, you check for disproportionality. That is, you look at the area that is being divided between the two states under the um, relevant sorry, under the adjusted equidistance line. And then you see if that is plainly disproportionate to the length of the relevant coastlines that are uh, adjacent or opposite each other. And that doesn't suggest that there has to be a one-to-one -one match. It's just a question of whether there needs to be, uh, whether there is gross disproportion. And indeed, in uh, the Black Sea case, a ratio of even one to three wasn't found to be wildly disproportionate. Okay, so as we've said, you start with an equi equidistance line between opposite, co opposite coasts. Now, arguments that are sometimes made is that, look, um, we as a coastal state are being cut off from having certain zones by the zones of other states, and we should be given a corridor to the high seas or a corridor onto the continental shelf. In general, courts have not favoured this kind of cut-off argument. Uh, courts are also not interested in distributive justice. Arguments are frequently raised about there are oil fields under these waters, um, there are fish stocks, we, uh, we are a poor state, they are a rich state, we need uh, distributive justice in where the median line is drawn so that one state or the other is economically favoured. Courts will not look at those economic questions, in part because the value of the resources in question may change in light of technology um, and or in light of new information, and it simply becomes too complex. So courts look at basically questions of geography. So one of the sayings in the law of the sea is the land dominates the sea. Courts are interested in questions of geography, not questions of economic justice. Um, 
Now, courts may also not rule on all areas of the boundary where there is potential overlap with the claims of a third party, either to maritime zones or a continental shelf. Uh, and finally, what, well, not finally, but <laughs> another question is, well, what constitutes a relevant or special circumstance? So questions that can arise uh, will have to do with the specific geography of a coastline. As I've said, the relative length of opposite coasts may be a factor. And uh, when you've drawn your provisional equidistance line, you may have done it without direct reference to islands, which could result in islands being on the wrong side of the line. Now, there are two ways of dealing with this situation. First is you give the islands an enclaved territorial sea. You strip them of their other zones and say, in a, in a sense, too bad, the island is on the wrong side of the line, it gets a territorial sea and that is all. The other possibility is what's called half effect. This is complicated, but effectively you draw two median lines. One just between the coastlines of the, main, the two parties mainland, the ordinary median line. Then you draw another median line where you draw it out from the island. That would be giving the island full effect. Then you look at a map look on a map between the median line one out from just the uh, main coastlines out to median line two, taking account of the island, and then you split the difference. You cut that in half and bisect those two lines, and then that is the half effect line, um, if that makes sense. Okay, irrelevant circumstances, as we've said, um, Courts and tribunals aren't terribly interested in non-geographic factors. So we've already talked about the relevance of economic factors. They're also not generally swayed by security concerns or arguments about navigation, such as we need a corridor of the exclusive economic zone all the way to the high seas. Uh, that last argument is obviously not favoured because you have a right of navigation through other states' exclusive economic zones. You don't need a corridor under your zonal control all the way to the high seas to be able to ensure that legally your ships can reach the high seas. All right, so some practical problems that come up in delimitation cases before we look at maps. First, all of this relies on the idea that you know where the base points are. And there's a great deal of discretion on the part of both parties and courts in selecting what the relevant base points are that are said to be opposite each other. And we'll see some examples of how that makes big differences. You may also wind up with grey zones where a sliver of an EEZ is available to state A, but it falls on the wrong side of a provisional equidistance line, and so it's actually above the continental shelf of state B, but beyond state B's 200 nautical mile line. That probably sounds confusing. We'll see an example from the Bay of Bengal case. Uh, where, indeed, does your continental shelf end in a seaward direction, what's the boundary between the continental shelf and the area under international administration? Well, we'll cover that question in other classes. Um, also, we might have this argument I flagged about cutoff effects. So possibly the zones of other um, states may not only cut you off from the high seas, but cut you off from what you might think is your fair share of the continental shelf. We'll see an example in the Barbados, Trinidad and Tobago case. Uh, but again, tribunals have generally not given corridors out to the high seas or an outer continental shelf because of cutoff effects. Uh, and then a perennially controversial issue is this idea of whether um, rights in a natural continental shelf trump rights in a legal exclusive economic zone. That is, when we're looking at resources in the seabed, should you be able to say, you have no actual continental shelf uh, past, say, 50 nautical miles from your baselines, but you claim an exclusive economic zone out to 200 nautical miles. But our continental shelf actually extends into your EEZ. We have a geological continental shelf that connects to our land territory can we claim we should have that natural continental shelf and you just get rights in the water column? Courts and tribunals are generally completely unpersuaded by this argument. And they go, there's no difference. Every state has legal rights 
in its seabed up to 200 nautical miles subject to delimitation. The fact that you might be able to prove your geological continental shelf extends under another state's waters doesn't mean they don't get seabed resources jurisdiction within their own EEZ. Okay, uh, some other problems come up with islands and rocks. So we've already talked about um, what do you do with islands on the wrong side of a provisional line. They could be given half effect or an enclave. But you can also wind up with some interesting situations where you have islands on the correct side of the equidistance line. That is, if you take their zones into account, they could actually push that equidistance line out. So should you include them in setting the equidistance line? Um, or you could give them no effect at all and just say an island that's on the right side of the equidistance line under the circumstances shouldn't be given any effect. And we can see how that plays out in some of the cases. Uh, similar issues can also arise in the case of rocks that generate simply a territorial sea. Again, um, should they push uh, the equidistance line in one direction or the other by drawing 12 nautical mile arcs out from them? Okay, so let's look at the cases. What do each of these maps tell us? So the Black Sea case between Romania and the Ukraine um, was determined by the ICJ in 2009. Now what's interesting here is the red line represents Romania's claim. So Romania's over here uh, in the west of the diagram and is projected all the way out here towards the Ukraine in the east. Conversely, the Ukraine uh, in the east has projected its line much closer to Romania in the west. So both states have made maximum possible claims and unsurprisingly the court's final decision is probably going to run somewhere down the middle. There's also been a presumption uh, on the part of Romania that because the Ukraine is sovereign over Serpent's Island it's going to have to give that some kind of at least 12 nautical mile territorial effect resulting in this cut. So what did the ICJ actually do? Well, on the left, we've got uh, the ICJ's selection of base points to form the provisional equidistance line. Now, the interesting point here is how very few points the ICJ has relied upon because of the particular configurations of the coast. So the discretion here uh, involved makes a lot of difference. So you can see there's only uh, effectively maybe two points on each side from which the ICJ has measured distance. Then on the uh, right um, hand side we have uh, the area enclosed. So that's called the delimitation area and then the court looks at the comparability of the relevant coastline length. So we've got Romania down here in red and the Ukraine in blue. And notably, the, co the court did not count this large indent, this gulf, uh, as relevantly part of the coastline, but sort of drew a closing line across it for the purposes of working out what the equivalent facing coastlines were. And it's obvious that the Ukraine has a longer relevant coastline, but it was, it was found not to be so much longer that it should affect the uh, outcome in terms of where the line fell. Um, so the rule here is really looking for really gross or excessive disproportionality before you would adjust the result. All right, then we have um, some other uh, interesting cases. So in Peru and Chile, again, we have wildly different claims. Peru pushing down uh, its claim with an equidistance line, uh, Chile saying, no, 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 we've settled a maritime boundary along a parallel. And then an interesting question about where the two zone, where the two states' respective 200 nautical zone, 200 nautical mile exclusive economic zones might end, resulting in this potential area uh, here, where if you accepted Chile's claim, you might still have a chunk of EEZ awarded to Peru. So what did the court do? Well, in the end, it found that there was already an agreed maritime boundary for part of the length, and it then uh, drew a um, semicircle out from that boundary to find some other relevant base points for Peru. It was difficult to select relevant base points because of the configuration of the coast. Then having selected the base points, it uh, drew a line out to B, which was the maximum extent of Chile's 200 nautical mile zone, and then allowed 
uh, peruse EZ to cut in a bit. So we have this little sort of spur shaped area, uh, which while you might think it was actually Chile's side of um, the provisional equidistance line, the line has turned to allow Peru to claim as much EZ as it could. The idea being that this is of no detriment at all to Chile. It has no claim to an EZ in this area. Uh, and so then we have um, the final boundary line as agreed between points A, B and C. So the, the important point to note here is that where there is already an agreed boundary line for part of uh, a maritime boundary, a court or tribunal will always take that into account. They'll be very reluctant to overturn a previous agreement reached under a treaty. All right, uh, now what's interesting about the Nicaragua Honduras case? Um, there are a number of interesting features to the case, but one of them is the role of various um, keys. Uh, small um, features uh, that generate territorial seas, so rocks in the language of Article 121, Paragraph 3. So one can see that these have wound up generating 12 nautical mile zones, or in the case of this straight line here, an equidistance line between two different keys uh, held by Nicaragua and Honduras. So this is a median line between uh, overlapping 12 nautical mile claims. Then we have a 12 nautical mile claim coming out here from various Honduran keys. But the general direction of the equidistance line is clear, but it's been adjusted in light of these, in the language of Article 121.3, rocks. Um, uh, another interesting case is the Bay of Bengal case between Bangladesh and Myanmar. And of particular interest here is the grey zone, coloured appropriately enough in grey. Uh, so you have this situation where there's a provisional equidistance line that extends in a particular direction, and where Bangladesh's maximum possible claim comes to the green dotted line, but Myanmar's maximum possible 200 nautical mile claim uh, extends beyond the equidistance line, again in a kind of um, spur or triangular wedge shape. And so the principle upheld here was that Myanmar should be able to claim that area. It should be able to exercise EEZ rights in that area, and the final uh, maritime boundary line would have to be adjusted accordingly. But this would involve a division in that the continental shelf underneath that claim would still belong to Bangladesh. So this is allowing EZ rights in the water column. Um, and yes, uh, so that's probably the best way I can explain it, where you have an EEZ overlapping another state's uh, continental shelf claim, it is possible to have such a division in the case of a grey zone. Uh, it's generally not um, permitted in other situations to divide the continental shelf and water column in this fashion. This is the exception. All right, so one of those cases where an argument for such a division was made was in the case of cutoff effects in Barbados and Trinidad and Tobago. So this is a useful map because you can see here that Trinidad and Tobago's 200 mile zone extends out in green. Um, then we have in relation to uh, Barbados, um, this, its 200 nautical economic zone uh, mapped in red. And what we have in the crosshatched area of red and green here where I'm moving the mouse, is an area that could be Trinidad and Tobago's continental shelf projecting out this way, or uh, Barbados's exclusive economic zone. And it was found in this case that this wasn't uh, a sort of grey zone question. Um, this was in fact a case where Barbados's Beyond Trinidad and Tobago's 200 nautical mile limit, Barbados should get both the water column rights and 
the continental shelf rights and this blocked Trinidad and Tobago from having access to this outer continental shelf area beyond 200 nautical miles, which seemed to Trinidad and Tobago very unfair because you had Barbados and various other islands and uh, various other states that all could claim part of this, but it was being zone locked. Uh, so you might think uh, that in such a case, the sort of Bay of Bengal approach was preferable. Okay, um, now another uh, very complex dispute is between Nicaragua and Colombia, and you'll note that Colombia is not um, close to uh, Nicaragua in this map, but nonetheless it had a number of island possessions off the coast of Nicaragua, and the question was how to give effect to those possessions, because a 200 nautical mile zone projected from these islands would obviously reach the coast of Nicaragua and extinguish its zones. Um, so the anticipated solution amongst many international lawyers was they would just get enclaves, 12 nautical mile enclaves like these islands up here. But the court uh, instead gave them um, limited effect facing Nicaragua, but then wherever possible gave them a full EEZ out towards the high seas. Um, so this was a wildly controversial ruling as far as Nicaragua was concerned uh, and certainly caught a lot of international lawyers by surprise, but at least gave effect to uh, the sovereign right of Colombia to have uh, exclusive economic zones perhaps off these islands. So in terms of um, the point I'm making, The critical thing to appreciate is that the rules of maritime boundary delimitation are relatively general. Um, they're certainly binding as a matter of law, but there's a lot of discretion in how they're applied. So states will usually try and reach agreement between themselves wherever possible before going to arbitration or a court like the ICJ or the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, because the results may be surprising and uncertain. Nonetheless, uh, courts and tribunals will attempt to apply these principles as fairly as possible, but geography is so different from case to case that it can be hard um, to eliminate the very large areas of discretion left to um, judicial or arbitral decision makers in these cases. Thank you.